I'm actually fortunate and blessed that I get to bat lead off. Ain't that what they say in baseball, bat lead off? Um, for throughout the month of July, we'll be walking through this new series, which is entitled The Unshakables. And all month long, the ministerial staff will be sharing with you some unshakable principles that we as believers need to stand unwaveringly for and on. Kids, help me with this. Ain't it like y'all say, uh, we're going to teach some things that we need to stand on business about? We're standing on business. Can we, can we stand on some business? Okay, all right. My, my kids didn't help me out. Oh, I was good? Okay, thank you, baby. All right. And each week, we'll be coming uh, to you from, uh, with different unshakables. Um, and today we're, is our first installment. Again, I'm blessed to be able to bat lead off. And today we'll be standing on the unshakable truth of seek God, not sin. Seek God, not sin. Again, we're going to stand ten toes down on these unshakable truths. Standing on the business, standing on the promises of our Lord. And I'm so thankful for God's word as revealed to us in the Bible. Some of us say that the Bible, B-I-B-L-E, is basic instructions before leaving earth. That's cool. That works. But I like to take it a step further. Books inspired by lived experience. And today we're going to take a walk with a prophet by the name of Amos. Our lesson text comes from Amos, the fifth chapter. And we'll be spending a little bit of time in verses four through six. If you would hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says to Israel. Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel. Do not go to Gilgal. Do not journey to Beersheba. For Gilgal will surely go into exile and Bethel will be reduced to nothing. Seek the Lord and live. For he will sweep through the tribes of Joseph like a fire. It will devour them and Bethel will have no one to quench it. Seek God, not sin. By way of background, uh, Amos is one of what they call the minor prophets, not because of his stature, because his book was any less important than any others, but uh, he, he's considered one of the minor prophets because of the length of his book. Um, he was a prophet. He wasn't a prophet by vocation. He was a sheep breeder. Basically, he was just a country preacher who God had taken from his flock and commanded him to prophesy against Israel. Further in the background, Amos prophesied to Israel during a time of great economic prosperity and military success. They were bad. They were doing really well. They experienced great wealth and luxury. However, these successes, with these successes came a penchant for idolatry or idol worship. And it led to a nation in moral decline. And this is where Amos enters the scene to deliver a message from God. That prosperity doesn't imply kingdom blessings when those successes are mixed with rebellion against God. Basically, sin. Our working definition, if I had to give this a more uh, textbook definition, sin is this. We define sin as this. Humankind's failure to measure up to God's perfect standards of righteousness, whether in thought, word, or deed. In other words, it's missing the mark. God set a standard, and we all fall short of that mark, and that is our sin. Some of our sin is willful. I ain't doing that. Lord, I know you said forgive them, but you don't know what they did to me. Anybody, is there anybody other than me? Well, you're a sinner too. Amen. Um, Sin is when we rebel against God. And again, staying with the text, Amos is prophesying to a nation. That's why I was blessed and fortunate once I was assigned the book of Amos, this particular chapter. I was like, oh, I get excited because Amos is dealing with a collective, an entire nation. He's speaking to the nation as a whole. But for us who live in the West, we, we tend to look at our faith and even our sin in individual terms. And that can result in us being siloed or individualistic and really narrow in our perspective. Sadly, we've been fooled into thinking that our personal sins don't really matter that much uh, so long as 
we keep our life right. Uh, you know, that's all we need to be concerned with. We learned a couple weeks ago, those things that we're concerned with are our pleasures, our projects, our possessions, our power, and our professions. But I've got news for us today. Just like Amos had news for the nation of Israel, morally corrupt and sinful individuals lead to morally corrupt and sinful nations. If we look in 2 Kings, 2 Kings shows us Israel's sins. There's so many, but I'm going I'm to go through a few. We're going to spend a little bit of time in going through a few today. They imitated the customs of the nations that God had driven out before them as they entered the promised land. A f- something that Moses had expressly forbid them to do. Even Israel's leaders who were entrusted to lead people in holiness and faithful, they even succumbed to imitating the other nations. They began to worship other gods. Not the great I am that we were singing about, but other lowercase g gods. They moved in secret, or at least they thought they were, and they built what they called high places. These are alternate places of worship. And again, these were forbidden in Moses' law. And they built them all around towns, thinking that God wouldn't notice or even care. They even set up man-made sacred pillars. You see, I do the air quotes, sacred pillars or Asherah poles where they would worship high on the hill. You see, Israel held this false belief that they could just sprinkle a little God, sprinkle a little religiosity around the culture, that would be okay. It's kind of like us today. When we think that we can simply plaster the Ten Commandments on classroom walls and we can present, prevent a nation from criminalizing homelessness, Or that by allowing the rich to go untaxed while failing to provide workers a living wage, we can make America great again. But I digress. We're going to walk through this text together. We're going to pick up at the fourth verse of Amos' prophecy when he's telling Israel that this is what the Lord says to you, Israel. I mean America, I mean Israel. Seek me and live. When he says seek, he's talking about, uh, he's not talking about an occasional kind of thing, an occasional search for something. No, instead, this seeking is a diligent search, meaning to do so earnestly, painstakingly, early, often, and always. Here's a newsflash. We're all seeking something. Some of us are seeking love and affection from a mate. Some of us are seeking a better paying job. Some of us are even seeking acceptance from others. But these pursuits, these things are based on a cause and effect kind of relationship. Meaning that if I find that man or woman, then I will find love. If I find that better paying job, then my finances will be better. If I find acceptance from this certain group or this certain person, then I'll be made complete. But what God is, was telling Israel, and he's telling us today, is that this seeking is referring to both humanity's duty and reward. And that this seeking that he's commanded of us isn't a cause and effect kind of scenario. Instead, it's a one. It's singular. Where one is, there is the other. I'm going to make it real plain for you. Basically, what God is telling us is that to seek God is to live. To seek God is to find him, and God is life, and God is the source of life. And in our seeking, we need to seek God, not for anything that he can give us, but seek God for himself, not to get anything out of him, not for his gifts, but for who he is. El Shaddai, God Almighty. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord who is our banner. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord who is our peace. If I had to boil it all down, I'd simply say this. God is life. And life doesn't exist aside from him. We want to spend some time on this firm foundation that when we seek God's face, 
we will find God's grace. And then Amos goes on, to, after we've, we, we're seeking God so that we may live, he actually takes a turn and says, all right, if you do this, you will live. But this is what he kind of sarcastically started referencing Gilgal, Bethel, and Beersheba. And I, I thought it would be good for us to spend a little bit of time understanding the significance of why he would mention these three places. You see, when we're not earnestly seeking God's face or his presence, we run the risk of easily falling into sin. You see, when we take our eyes off of God, we run the risk of making idols of the things and even the places rather than giving God the due that he is deserving. And here in this fifth verse, Amos is telling Israel that if you continue in the sin of idolatry, in the sin that you appear to love so much, that you would see where this foolish devotion to false gods will lead you. You see, Bethel was significant. It was a significant place in Israel's history. It's kind of like, for modern day, for us to understand, it's, it's kind of like Philadelphia. Y'all know what Philadelphia is significant in American history, right? Because it's a spot, it's a, the place where the Constitution was signed. Better yet, it's kind of like Washington, D.C. We, we revere, we just had the 4th of July, right? We over here saluting the flag and all this and other, because it, 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 these places have and hold significance to us. Bethel held a similar significance to the nation of Israel, because Abraham camped near Bethel when they first entered Canaan. Jacob's name was changed to Israel at Bethel. Israel would even go to Bethel to consult with God during the time of the judges. Even the Ark of the Covenant was kept in Bethel for many years, but Bethel had fallen and become a house of idols. You see, Jeroboam, one of the kings, Jeroboam the first, established a temple there, not to the great I am or the living God, but to the golden calves there. And even after Israel's destruction at the hands of the Assyrians, the conquerors left false priests there to corrupt the land. What he's saying, telling us and why he mentioned Bethel is because Bethel became the place to worship God. But when God becomes fixed to a place or an event, that place or event can sometimes substitute for God. A firm foundation to remember here is that we do not find God in a place, but in a person. We're going to keep on walking because as we talk about Bethel, he goes on to talk about Gilgal. Gilgal was significant too because it was a place of new beginnings. It was the first place Israel camped when they entered the promised land after escaping and fleeing bondage in Egypt. When the Israelites laid siege to Jericho, Gilgal served as the headquarters for the, that battle and for other military conquests. Gilgal was that site that was important. It was important for the firsts, the first during Israel's history. The, the activity at Gilgal and Israel's devotion to honor these activities is what Israel decided to do. They started to praise and worship their military successes. They began to, uh, uh, which started to mess up their minds and obscure them from the real revealed word of God and his truths. See, it was at Gilgal that Saul, Israel's first king, disobeyed God when he took matters into his own hands and attacked the Philistines instead of waiting on Samuel as God had instructed him. You see, Saul's impatience in that moment in his sin caused him to act ahead of God's instructions. Anybody other than me ever done that? Didn't turn out too good, did it? And just like it didn't turn out good for us, it didn't turn out good for Saul because Saul had convinced himself that what he was doing, his activity, was the kind of leadership that the people needed. Uh, after all, you know, the, the Philistines, a.k.a. the bad guys, uh, I'm going to attack the bad guys. Isn't that a righteous action? But we got to remember, we got to be cautious of this, because a, a zeal for righting wrongs or getting the bad guys can lead to some disastrous outcomes. Because if we're not careful... Our activity can begin to override biblical truths. If I had to give it a modern-day example of this kind of sinfulness of a nation, 
I would, I'm harking back to America's bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the attack on Pearl Harbor. See, we got to get the bad guys. God, they've done something bad. We got to get the bad guys. But in getting the bad guys, oh, what an atrocity we committed. Firm foundation is another one that can be gleaned from Gilgal. We do not find God in a campaign, military or political, but in a commitment, a commitment to obeying God's word. We're going to keep on going because Amos is still walking with us. He's, he's told us about Bethel. He's, he's, he's taught us about Gilgal and the foolishness of being enamored with our activities. But in Beersheba, Beersheba was another prominent place in Israel's history. For it was Abraham was living in Beersheba when God told him to sacrifice Isaac in the land of Moriah. It's significant because um, it, it, it was significant in Israel's history just like Bethel but over time, it became synonymous with evil. It was in Beersheba that Samuel's wicked sons lived. And though they were entrusted with leadership as judges, they took bribes and they perverted God's judgment. Their actions were even the main reasons that the people of Israel began to clamor and call for a king. Beersheba became known for political oaths and agreements made with the ungodly. If I had to make a modern day comparison, I would compare that to Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. But the firm foundation here is that we do not find God in promises of people, politicians or presidents, but in the power from God provided by the sacrifice of our Prince of Peace, Jesus the Christ. Now that he's told us to seek God and to live, and he's shown us the error and the foolishness of when we place our sinful worship in things and places other than God, Amos encapsulates, he wraps up our lesson text in verse 6 by repeating the same phrase he did at the beginning, seek the Lord and live. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on further to say that he gives us the consequences of not seeking the Lord. If we don't, check this out, he will sweep through the tribes of Joseph like a fire. It will devour them, and Bethel, Gilgal, Beersheba will have no one to quench it. You see, it's in this sixth verse, Amos is repeating this original call for Israel to repent of their sin of idolatry. Idolatry is when we worship something, someone other than our God. And to seek the Lord so that we, they might live. Not, and this living is not just to remain alive, to remain breathing, but to obtain possession of true life. That which can only come from a right relationship with God. Jesus put this verse 6 this way. The seek the Lord and live. He put it this way. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You see, in seeking God and his kingdom, this isn't a one day a week kind of activity. Just showing up on Sunday ain't going to cut it. What Jesus is t- teaching us, what Amos is teaching us, what these books inspired by lived experience is trying to teach us today is that instead of, of this one day a week kind of activity, we need a daily commitment to adopting and seeking God's perspective on life as revealed through his word. And that includes living out that perspective. It's one thing to seek it. But it's another thing to walk that thing out. So if I had to wrap this all up with with one bottom line, it would be this. With God, life is an endless hope. But without God, life is a hopeless end. (laughs) Seek God and live. I understand. I've, I've, the Lord's been, I've been walking with him for a minute now. And this seeking has led me to, to understanding the words of the, the hymn writer who said, my hope is built on nothing less, nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground, all of the ground, 
Republican ground, Democratic ground, worldly ground, professional ground, all other ground is seeking sand. God has given us this word today, family, because it challenged me. I'm going to just be honest with you. I didn't do it. It wasn't a Saturday night special. Please don't, don't hear me wrong when I say it. it wasn't a Saturday night special, but I wrestled with the Lord last night just like Jacob because he wanted, it's important. He, he, he implored me. He, 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 he encouraged me. He extolled, he, he pulled out of me this, this, this thing that I got to tell you is that a life apart from God isn't a life at all. What we focus on we become. If we focus on the things of the world, we become more like the world. Ah, ah, but when we lift our eyes to the hills from which cometh our help, realizing that our help comes from the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth, now we begin to look like him. I don't know about you, but I want to be more like Jesus. I don't want to look like the world. I don't even want to look like what I used to look like when I had hair. Oh, no, no, I want to be, continue this work of being transformed in the image of Jesus the Christ. Yeah. And because of that, the, because of this wrestling, the Lord told me to issue a challenge for us this week. He says that we should focus and keep our focus on becoming more like Jesus. Because what we focus on becomes our destination. This week, I want to challenge us all to begin each day acknowledging that we need, that we have a need, and instead of turning to the world to meet that need, we'll turn to God. We will seek God painstakingly, consistently, faithfully, all day, every day, and in every way. And we will not seek sin. You see, in this seeking, this, this requires us to spend some time in prayer. It requires us to spend time reading God's word. Not just to read it to check something off of our to-do list for today, but to spend time in God's word. Take your time. Pour over God's word. And, not a, and, and after we do that, we should allow him and allow ourselves to be still. Be still long enough to know that he is God, the great I am. 